Well, good morning and welcome to College Twanku Jaffa. My name is Glenn Moody and I'm very proud to be the principal of this school. I joined the school almost two years ago and I found it to, I, and I have found it to be a warm and welcoming environment and also an institution which provides the highest quality of education. And I am a parent of the school as well. I moved to Malaysia having spent nearly 20 years working in private boarding schools in the UK, including most recently as the head of a school in Cornwall. There is a lot to tell you about the IGCSE years at KTJ, and I will soon pass over to our head of secondary academic, Anna Fournier, who will explain more. However, before I do this, I want to give you just a little bit of the background of the school. KTJ was founded in 1991, making us one of the most more well-established international schools in Malaysia. It was founded by three members of the Nigeri Sembilan royal family, young Amat Mulia Tunku Nakiden, young Amat Mulia Tunku Dara, and young Amat Mulia Tunku Imran, and named in honor of their father, who was, of course, a king of Malaysia. They were inspired by their boarding school experiences in the UK and their vision was to provide a similar experience here locally in Malaysia, embracing the best of British and international education but firmly rooted in a Malaysian context. KTJ provides a comprehensive all-round education which we feel offers the best preparation for students future lives, education and careers. We believe in delivering not just an academic education inside the classroom, but educating the whole person. This includes helping students to find their passions, building their characters, and giving them a, a global perspective. Underpinning all of this is a strong mission and ethos, which goes back to the founding of the school. At the heart of this are our values of integrity, empathy, and mutual respect. These values are central to the way the school is run and to, and to the decisions which we make. KTJ has an ambitious vision for the next 10 years, and you can find out more about this from our publication, Vision 2030, which is available on our website. So I would just like to reiterate what I said at the beginning, a very warm welcome to KTJ. I hope you will find this morning's presentation informative and I hope we will see you again soon. I will now pass over to Anna, who will deliver a presentation on IGCSE at KTJ. If you have any questions for either Anna or me, you can ask these via the chat feature. We will then do our best to answer all questions following her presentation. Over to you, Anna. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed, Glenn. And hello to everyone who's joined us this morning. Um, as Glenn said, my role at the school is to be in charge of the um, academic side in the second year. Um, and um, I've been at KTJ for, this is the end of my um, sixth year now. Um, it's a fantastic school, um, very, very happy here. And um, I am delighted to be able to talk to you today about the GCSE courses that we offer. So the, in the course of this talk, I'm going to be explaining to you um, what GCSEs are, um, how the curriculum is set, um, how it's examined, and the subjects that we offer, um, what to consider when making decisions about which um, subjects um, your child would um, best be best placed to study. Um, and then, as Glenn said, at the end, we will take questions that you might have. I'm going to be structuring my um, presentation very much um, as questions, so it is possible that I might answer all the questions that you have, um, so we'll see how well I do. So first of all, um, for those of you who haven't experienced um, an international curriculum before, I thought you might would like to know what IGCSEs start, um, what they're for and what they stand for. So the I is for international and the GCSE stands for General Certificate of Secondary Education. Um, they are subject based, they're academic qualifications and they are internationally recognized. Um, they are two year courses and um, they are um, they start in Form 4, um, which is also referred to um, in some other schools as Year 10, and they conclude at the end of Year 11. Many of the courses are exam-based, 
um, with students sitting examinations in May and June of their um, Form 5 or Year 11 year. Um, but some have coursework elements which will be completed prior to this, and some have examinations which are practical, um, for example, the arts and the sciences and, and um, PE. So why, why would, why do we choose IGCSEs and why would you choose IGCSEs? Well, they fit extremely well with our mission. Um, our, the holistic education um, that we um, provide for our students um, means that we, we don't just want them to pass exams, but we actually want them to develop a whole range of skills that's going to be useful to them in their lives. And GCSEs offer, offer that. The, the curriculum, we also feel, is um, robust and rigorous, um, and, um, and the fact that it's internationally recognized and it prepares students for their next steps, whether that's A-level or a different course, is something that we firmly believe. Um, there's also a range of options available, quite a wide range of options, as you'll see shortly. Um, and um, we don't have a, a streaming system. Students are not pigeonholed. That's something that um, possibly in, in my generation, when I was at school, there was a science stream or there was an art stream. Um, we encourage a range of um, subjects for students to take, and that is possible with IGCSEs. So the curriculum is set by examination boards. And there are various different ones. We use two. Most of our GCSEs or IGCSEs are set through Cambridge, um, who've um, recently rebranded themselves to be Cambridge Assessment International Education, or CAIE. Um, and uh, our maths examinations are taken through Pearson at Excel. So the syllabus for each subject is published online. It's available for anybody. You can go to the website and download it. And the examinations that the students um, take are set by the examination boards. They're also marked by the examination boards. So apart from some parts of coursework, all the examinations are not marked by the teachers. So the examinations themselves, as I said, they, they take place in May and June of four or five. And in most cases, um, uh, that's, that's at the end of the course um, for the students. For there's a, It's slightly different for maths and um, the way we structure it, which I'll come back to in a minute. Um, the examinations themselves are spread out over a number of weeks, and the examination board will set the timetable for that. Um, we, we complete the syllabus well before this and give the students a chance to have a trial or a mock examination, which takes place in the January of their final examination year. Um, and when it comes to the examinations, we, we stop regular lessons and students move on to what's called study leave. So they can work from home should they wish, um, if they don't have an examination, um, or they can get specific help from their teachers. So the number of examinations that students will take depends on the subject. So, for example, for maths, there are two examinations, but for science, there are three, and one of them is a practical exam. And you can find details of exactly what examinations are set for each student in the um, IGCSE handbook, which I will share a QR code to at the end of this presentation. So the marking of the um, examination boards, as I think I've already said, this is, um, this is something that is marked by the exam boards themselves, not the teachers, apart from subjects which have coursework, which we mark. When we mark work ourselves, we are required by the exam board to set, send off some or all of um, the work that we've marked for moderation to check that our marking is in line with other schools. Now, the grading of the examination for um, the Cambridge exams, so for most subjects, follows the letter grades, which you're probably familiar with, with an A star being a highest level going down to a G. C and above is seen um, as, as a pass. Um, for maths, we, um, the, the, the exam board that we use for maths, Cambridge, uh, not Cambridge, sorry, Pearson at Excel, they use uh, uh, the system which is now commonly used um, throughout the UK, and that is a nine to one system. So this graphic here shows you um, how the numbers correlate to the letters. They don't correlate exactly. So um, a nine is an extremely high um, A star and a very difficult grade to get. Um, so you can see there's in the A star to A, B to C, there are three numbers and it, it provides more distinction um, at these levels for the top level students. 
both sets of um, grades are recognized for, by um, universities worldwide. So as I said, there are um, a number of subjects that the students take because range is important. So all students will um, sit for an English language IGCSE, also mathematics, one language, there is a choice between Chinese, Malay and French, um, one science, um, at least, there can be more. Um, so that's biology, physics, or chemistry. And for students for whom English is an additional language, they will also have EAL classes, but this is in, replace of one, in, in place of one GCSE. So there isn't a GCSE um, in EAL that they sit. Now, the subjects that the students can choose is quite a long list, as you can see from this page. We've got 20 different options of GCSEs here. Um, and um, the students are given lots of help as to um, what would be a good choice and a good mix for them. I'm going to keep on coming back to this idea of, of, of a mixture of courses rather than just um, pigeonholing the students into one particular area. We do have some rules to make sure that the students um, maintain this range. So, for example, we wouldn't um, allow a student to take accounting and business studies and economics as we feel that they, those subjects are too similar and they don't provide enough range. So for those subjects, we, we would suggest a maximum of two out of those three. Um, it, we wouldn't um, uh, suggest that a student took both food technology and design technology, just one of those subjects would be useful. Um, physical education is a new GCSE for us that we're going to be offering as of um, this coming August. And thinking skills is, um, is not a, a GCSE subject. This is a course that we are going to be providing for students who we feel could do with some help in um, their GCSEs and that we think that the, the total number of GCSEs that um, uh, some students will be sitting would be too much for them. So that's a support course. So speaking of support, um, we have different um, support across the school. We, our teachers are wonderful, they get to know the students really well and they will support them through their studies, um, differentiating to make sure that the students are appropriately stretched and for those who might find, be finding things um, a bit more challenging um, to make sure that, that they have um, the scaffolding and the support that they need to be successful. We also have um, a wonderful learning support department who um, uh, will help students if they're having particular issues with any skills or they need a little bit of extra time with one particular subject. Um, our EAL department um, supports students, as I've already mentioned, whose English is not their first language. Um, and this is absolutely essential, the support that they provide, bearing in mind that all the courses are delivered and examined in English, apart from the language courses. Um, so those lessons are very, very important for many of our students. And finally, for students who are having issues, um, who would like to discuss things confidentially, we do have counsellors who can help them um, with issues which might cross over into academics, but also onto the social side. Um, Malay is um, a subject that is um, compulsory for all Malaysian students. And um, one of the questions that um, I am quite frequently asked is, is does, does my child need to take Malay? Um, the answer is, it is a government, governmental requirement if you're a Malaysian that, that you study Malay and local history. Um, the great news is that we now have two different GCSEs to offer for this subject. So we can offer um, foreign language Malay or a new, new um, first language Malay. So if your child is currently in Form 3, it's possible that they've already started um, heading towards the first language Malay route, which is more challenging, but it's a fantastic course which includes um, elements of poetry and literature um, rather than just a basic mastering of the language. Um, the, um, as I said, the, the local history lessons, um, in the past we've um, had these as, as standalone lessons. We're going to be combining them with Malay lessons in the future. So you may be interested to know how many subjects um, the students study. So, so the short answer to this is nine. However, um, this does um, vary a little bit um, depending on um, if, you, if you're translating this question as, as to how many GCSEs will my child take. So they will study nine subjects, but if they're taking um, EAL um, and transferable skills, they would not sit GCSEs in those subjects at the end. Um, 
sometimes I'm asked the question, can my child take another subject? Um, and, and the answer to that is um, they don't need to, and it's very, very stressful, and we can't fit it into the timetable. Nine is plenty of subjects to give them super breadth for the preparation for their A-level subjects. So making decisions um, about um, what subjects um, you um, and your child think would be best for them to study. I would say the most important um, thing to do at the start of this process is to make sure you and they, the, the child and you um, really think about what makes them happy. Happy brains learn better. And I'm quite sure that as parents, what you want for your child is for them to be happy in the future. So if they've been thinking that they want to be um, a doctor, for example, in the future, but they really don't enjoy their, um, their science lessons at all. Um, and um, when it comes to English lessons, that is where they're shining. Medicine is probably not the best career for them. Um, so uh, thinking about what makes them happy. Also, making sure that um, they're aware of what's on offer. There are so many different careers available today that weren't available when I was a child, and there will be more careers available in the future. Um, so talking to um, family members, extended family members, friends, so that your, your children are aware of all these different careers that they might be interested in the future. Um, looking into careers and researching careers is actually shown to have a really positive impact for students. If they come up with a plan, it has a positive impact on, the, on the, the success of their final career, even if whatever plan they made completely changes along the way. Just being quite intentional in what choices they're making is very, very helpful. And as I've said before, when you're making decisions um, about GCSE choices, do think about the range. The range of subjects is going to be the best preparation for the future because of all the varying skills that are developed um, through different subjects. There are certain requirements for particular careers. So if, um, if a student is particularly interested in any of the, the um, biomedical, medicine, dentistry, um, or veterinary science careers, they definitely do need to be taking sub, um, science subjects at GCSE. Um, but we suggest very, very strongly that they complement these with art subjects. So for example, picking up history or, or drama or art that is helpful for them if they want to have these careers because it does show breadth and it, it's going to develop um, other skills, whereas the sciences will develop similar skills to each other. Um, for engineering, additional maths in, is useful, particularly if students were planning on going to any top universities. Um, and um, for mechanical engineering, physics will be a requirement and for chemical engineering, chemistry. Um, some of our students are very interested in psychology. Um, psychology, you need, I mean, we, maths is a, is a compulsory um, IGCSE, um, and um, you'd want to take that at A level as well. But in order to prepare for um, psychology, a mixture of sciences and humanities would be the best preparation. Um, to study economics at university, additional mathematics would be helpful, but not essential. Um, and then for careers in um, accounting and finance, economics would be a very useful IGCSE. Um, for students who really want to become accountants in the future, it is not necessary to study accounting. That is not compulsory for either GCSE or A-level. So they shouldn't feel that they have to study accounting at that level. Um, and if you are weighing up between um, economics and business studies, um, in general, economics is, is seen as a um, more academic qualification than business studies. Um, for law, there's an awful lot of writing in law. So subjects such as history and English literature, which help students practice and develop their writing skills. These are really great GCSEs to take. Now, we do have some entrance requirements for um, some IGCSEs. And the reason why we have these entrance requirements is to, to make sure that we are not setting um, a student up for um, a failure. So if students aren't to a certain level in these three subjects that I'm going to mention, they're not going to be successful at IGCSE. And the first one that I'm going to talk about is additional mathematics. This is a very, very popular subject for our students, but it's a very difficult one. 
And the, um, there is a perception that additional mathematics is required for A-level, and this is not the case. You, do, you can take a maths A-level without having done additional maths GCSE. If students are accepted onto the GCSE additional maths course, they will need um, to complete the um, uh, IGCSE course in just one year. So I mentioned maths is a little bit different when it comes to timing of examinations. Um, form four students would sit their IGCSE maths in the May, June of their form four year, which um, effectively gives them less than a calendar year to prepare for the exam, which is challenging, really is challenging. Once they've um, sat their IGCSE maths, they then move on to the additional maths syllabus, which they then sit at the end of form five. Now, in the past, we've had students who were really keen to, to take additional maths and their maths wasn't really up to it. And so they, they sat their um, GCSE at the end of form four and didn't perform very well. So they got a C or, or, or below, um, which is not going to be very useful to them in the future um, when they're using this for applications to the next level of study. So not only did they have to retake the GCSE the following year, but they also struggled or dropped out of the additional maths course in Form 5, by which time it was too late for them to take a, a different GCSE because they'd missed the whole year. And so they ended up with one less GCSE, which just wasn't helpful to them. So to make sure students are... Um, um, of the, of the right level to be able to access the additional maths course, what we do is we say that they should get a 4.5 in their checkpoint exam or a B in their end of year exam. Now, if any of, um, if any of the um, people watching this webinar, if your students are, if your child is in form three right now, obviously um, we haven't had checkpoint exams or end of year exams this year, but our teachers have got a very, very good idea of the level at which um, your child performs at. And so um, we would be in touch if, um, if we felt that the additional maths course was going to be too challenging for them. So any questions about additional maths, we just speak individually to parents with them and, and give them the very best advice that we can. Um, English literature is another um, course that we would check the child's level of English before accepting them onto the GCSE. Um, students who don't have a certain level of English would find this course particularly challenging and we want our students to be successful. So we would look on, at students on a case by case basis. And the third subject is music. Um, uh, the Music I GCSE is a fantastic GCSE, but it's, it is at a high level and um, students do need to, at the beginning of the course, be at a grade three. They don't need to have passed any exams, but equivalent of a grade three level in a solo instrument, which also could be voice. And the director of music would be able to um, check that with you um, and assess the students to see whether or not they were um, ready for the IGCSE course. So what you need to do now is um, just spend time with your child thinking about the future and thinking about what makes them happy um, and what, what makes them excited and what the big picture is um, and considering what would be the best combination of GCSEs to fit into this, um, to this, this vision for the future. Um, Asking questions is really, really helpful. Um, students should ask their friends who are older than them, ask them about GCSEs um, and, um, sorry, IGCSEs, and ask, ask them what, what they enjoy, which ones they didn't enjoy very much and why. And um, also asking the um, sick form students is helpful. Um, and um, ask, ask us, ask me. Um, we have lots of um, different people at the school who can help out. My assistant heads, Pete Cross and Hamish, um, can help you um, as house parents, also a great sources of information because they'll, they'll know your children really well. So asking lots of questions and considering, you don't have to make decisions right now. Um, and again, as I said earlier on, finding out about possible careers and requirements for those, those careers that your children might be interested in. Um, this next slide shows you a timeline. Um, I haven't put specific dates in because this changes a little bit each year. So for Form 3s, um, in the first term, mentors will begin to talk to them about options and we will start to explain the process of what they need to be thinking about. Um, in January, um, we'll provide an IGCSE taster day for the students so they can go and try out a lesson in a subject that they're interested in. 
And um, during February time, students will have lots of conversations with their mentors and with you about what they might want to choose. And late February, early March, there'll be a date when we ask you to um, make some decisions um, about which subjects you'd like to choose and um, submit a form. Now, the reason why we ask for this in February, March is because um, in order to make sure that we can design a timetable that accommodates the unique combination of choices that students um, um, in uh, KTJ have selected, um, we need to get the information and then the timetabling team makes what's called blocks. Um, so different subjects are put into um, blocks, which are, um, you can imagine columns in a table. And, um, and then um, subsequently, should any students change their mind, they will need to, they won't have, uh, be able to change, to, to um, select any unique combination of subjects. They would actually have to choose subjects from these particular blocks, which isn't usually a problem. We design them so they're as flexible as possible. And then finally in June, um, there would be um, follow-up from the um, head of maths if there were any students who had selected additional maths that we were concerned that they that they weren't going to be um, appropriate for that subject. Um, along the way, lots of information, and we were always available to answer questions if you have any specific questions for us. So my last slide is the QR code that I promised. This, if you point your camera at the screen, is going to take you to an online IGCSE handbook which describes each of the courses we offer in more detail. And that's it from me. So I'm happy now to um, answer any questions. Thank you very much, Anna. Um, right, okay, I wonder if first of all, you could talk a little bit more about the process of selecting IGCSEs for uh, Form 3s who are not already at KTJ. You know, what support can KTJ provide with that and are the timelines similar? Um, the timelines are necessarily a bit different if you're not um, at KTJ because it does depend a little bit on when um, the student applies to the school. Um, so we, they're, they're not nearly so rigid. Um, the, uh, the registrar would be in touch with the applicants and explain the process, sharing the um, handbook that I just shared the link to. Um, and then um, what happens sometimes is that parents have questions, specific questions about their child. So Jane will put the um, parents in touch with me or in touch with um, one of our assistant heads of school. And um, we get in touch by email or make phone calls and give the best advice that we can. Um, because it's a brand new school and students arrive um, and sometimes it's several months prior that they made their choices. Some students do want to change their minds when they arrive, um, which um, we always do our best to accommodate. So it generally comes down to just lots of two-way conversations and discussions about um, what's going to work best. Yep. Okay, thank you. Right, um, so I'm just about to share with everyone uh, my email address, Anna's email address, and also the email address for a registrar, so that should come through to you on the chat. Um, Anna, there's a question here about why is maths Pearson and not um, Cambridge, but also could you also add to that um, whether Ad Maths is um, Pearson or Cambridge? Ad Maths is Cambridge. And Pearson, um, we use for mathematics because the department believes that this is a, a better syllabus um, for our students, which is going to give them a greater level of success with their IGCSE. Okay, and um, what about uh, for A-level maths? What do we do for A-level maths? For A-level maths, we also use Pearson at Excel. Yeah, okay, right, thank you very much. Uh, a, a detailed question here about um, Malay, which is some of which you've answered, but I think there's more to say about this. So my child is Malaysian and has never lived in Malaysia and has zero Malay knowledge, which we have to say is not unusual with students who join us, you know, perhaps with the parents live overseas. Yeah. Please comment on the level of attainment required by the government and exams. Please also comment on the need to do local history. Is local history examinable? Um, so there is no governmental requirement with regards to Malay attainment. Um, the students are required to study Malay and local history. Um, so um, please don't worry if your child hasn't ever studied Malay before. Um, we will look after them and they will be introduced and guided through the language. Um, uh, assuming you're a Malay speaker yourself, 
as with any language, uh, practice is really, really helpful. So um, having a chance to um, talk to your child in Malay, that is going to help them. I mean, it, equally, if your child elected to speak French and you happen to be, speak French or Chinese, that's going to help them with their language um, um, uh, development as well. Yeah. And do students have to sit the IGCSE? It's um, no, they don't have to sit any IGCSEs. They could come to KTJ and have a fantastic education and not sit any IGCSEs, but then they wouldn't get any um, certificates, which would be useful to them for the next level. Okay, so specifically, <laughs> they could not sit, they, they could choose not to sit the IGCSE. And they the could choose not to, but would we would be preparing them for the yeah, qualification? Yeah. And uh, another question about Malay can the foreign language Malay IGCSE be taken in Form 3? This used to be an option, um, and we've removed this as an option because we, what we would like to do is um, progress the students um, to taking their GCSEs in Form 5 and give them the option at that stage as to whether it's um, a foreign language or first language. It also gives them something to aim towards because they do have to keep doing the language until Form 5 as well, don't they? Yeah, that's very true. Yeah. Okay. Um, just for everyone's sake, I've shared... Um, the link to the website page, which has the IGCSE subject book uh, booklet, just in case you didn't manage to capture that QR code. Um, Anna, there's a question here. Do kids at um, this age have a defined idea of career path? I guess some do and some don't. Some change them. And yeah. I, I suspect, suspect also what you were talking about when you were linking subjects with careers was just, you know, making choices that don't rule out options for later. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think I think I think you've answered the question. Yeah. 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 Okay. So it worries, absolutely. Did Dan? Did you know what you wanted to be when you were um, thirteen? I did, but it certainly wasn't a school principal. <laughs> 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 uh, I did know what I wanted to be, but it wasn't this. So yeah, I think I think I would echo what you have to say about you know having something an aim in mind is very good, and if that aim changes, I don't think that matters too much. But having a sense of purpose. Um, you know, can be really useful. And uh, uh, I think, you know, for some kids that, that they, they work that out very young, others it takes time. But one of the things about being at KTJ is really trying to work out what your passions are. And that comes not just from what we do inside the classroom, but from the whole holistic approach to education. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, what about um, kids who are not fluent in English, Anna? Do you want to talk a little bit about what, the, what support we offer there? Yes. So, as I said, there's, um, there are EAL, English as Additional Language, lessons for the students who are not fluent in English, um, and that helps them improve their level. Um, our teachers are also very used to teaching students for whom English isn't a first language, and so they will differentiate and help support those students. Um, so that's not something to be concerned about. I think that's something that we've got a lot of expertise to support students in. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're, yeah, we've got uh, very experienced teachers in our EAL department who are able to provide whatever help is needed with that. Um, now one about the proficiency of French. So I'm, I'm assuming this is a case where a student might join us, um, you know, directly into Form 4 and they want to do IGCC French. What level of proficiency would be required? Well, ideally, someone would already have a certain proficiency in French, and I think it's quite hard to quantify proficiency in the language. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, um, it is very, very, very challenging to do incredibly well in a, in a GCSE if you only start in Form 4, in a, for a language, I mean, yeah. um, starting Form 4. So if a student was interested in that, we'd, we'd need to talk to them. Some, some people... Um, I know Dr. Moody is included in this. They're actually very good at picking up languages, and possibly he would <laughs> he would have been able to um, achieve a high grade in French if he only started in Form Four. Other people don't seem to be so gifted. I would include myself in that, and so it it would be a case of on an individual basis we'd look into it because ultimately we do want the student to achieve. But language learning is fantastic for your brain, and so um, I'm looking into that. And it's again we wouldn't force you to sit a GCSE in the subject. Yeah. Um, there's a question here. Um, you've kind of covered this, but if you could just reiterate, please. Um, the checkpoint exam, it says for ad maths, but I think we only have checkpoint for maths, don't we? Couldn't be taken this term due to COVID-19. Yeah. Um, how can um, this person know whether their son will do ad maths in Form 4 or not? So the teacher, um, teachers regularly assess students 
Um, and they assess them formally and they assess them informally. And so the teachers have an extremely good idea of the level at which the students um, sit. The, the examinations themselves pro provide us with some external data to discuss with parents, but very rarely do students perform it unexpectedly in the, the checkpoint or the end of year examination. So we're very confident that we can give the best advice, even though we don't have those two bits of data this, this current year. Okay, so um, students at KTJ who are in Form 3 and haven't set the checkpoint, will they, should they know already whether they're able to do Ed Maths next year? Um, the head of maths is actually working on it right now. We always leave it right to the end of the year because we want to have as much time as possible for the assessment. Yeah. So um, the head of maths will be in touch this coming week to any parents that we feel that their student, their child is just is not the, the right level to, to achieve at maths. Yeah. Okay. And, and as you reiterated before, that doesn't rule out, you know, A-level a maths. Um, we have, you know, lots of students who do well in, uh, do just single maths at IGCSE and do very well in A-level maths as well. But yes. some students just need a little bit longer to get to grips with some of the concepts, don't they? Yeah. Um, what about um, level of proficiency required for IGCSE Mandarin? Could you tell us a little bit about that? Oh yes, you, re you reminded me, I didn't actually talk about the levels of, uh, of, of Chinese. So um, yes, we do offer three different exams. Um, uh, levels of, um, for Mandarin. One is foreign language, one is second language, and one is first language. Um, so um, students who are current students of KTJ, our, our Chinese department would have a very good idea which would be the most appropriate level for them. And any students coming in um, from um, other schools, we test them right at the start, the Chinese department would test them and then they would make appropriate recommendations. Occasionally we get students um, switching between levels um, but, um, but, but generally, um, students, um, they're quite comfortable with the level at which, which we assess them and put them into that class. Yeah. Okay, I wonder if you could say a little bit more about design technology and what the options are within design technology. Yes, yeah, so um, design technology, um, if, you, if, you're not a, if you're not currently a parent of um, KTJ, we have a fantastic new building for design technology. Um, it's called the Waterfront, and I do encourage you to, um, when you can, come and have a look or look on our website at pictures. Um, the, the design technology course that we're offering next year is called, um, it's called Resistant Materials. Um, and so if you look in the um, handbook, you can see details of that course. Um, resistant Materials to me kind of means the hard stuff. So, um, so physically creating something possibly out of wood or plastic hence the name resistant materials. So there's a whole design process um, that um, is used um, for this GCSE and it's fantastic preparation um, if you were interested, for example, in architecture in the future, because the design process and construction and testing and, um, is all very relevant for that subject. Um, sometimes under the design technology um, uh, bracket, um, food technology is also, it's, it's a separate GCSE, but that's another subject that we, that we offer and um, students do get to cook, um, but beyond cooking, they learn an awful lot um, about food and, and nutrition in that subject area too. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to share the link to another page of our website, which is KTJ Learner Characteristics, which is something you've been working on and introduced quite recently to the school. I wondered if you could tell um, uh, attendees a little bit more about that and why it's so important to us at KTJ. Yes, so um, the holistic education that, that we provide, um, as I said already, is it's not just about um, getting some grades for students. Um, what we want them to do is to be equipped with the range of skills that are going to help them be successful in the future. Um, and we, we've had lots and lots of conversations about, well, what are these skills and are they just skills? Um, and are they dispositions? And, um, and we decided that we're going to call them characteristics because they're a mix of, of these things. Um, and you can actually see um, our logo just behind Glenn's ear of this. Um, it's that colorful, um, <laughs> he's going to try and point at it. <laughs> yes, very good. Um, those are our KTJ um, learner characteristics. Um, so there are a range of, of um, characteristics that we're um, going to be intentionally and very explicitly trying to um, develop in all the students um, within their academic lessons, but also in their extra curricular activities. Um, if you get a chance to look up close at the logo, um, it's designed like a flower and the inner petals are actually the um, 
the personal goals or the KGJ learner characteristics that are developed in primary. And then the outer petals are a development of the characteristics that we will be working on the students in secondary. So um, as adults, you can have a look at these and you can think, oh, how, how good am I at that? Is that something I need to work on? So everyone's on a continuum for these characteristics. And um, we'll be having lots of conversations with your child about, so, so which ones do you think you're, you're not so good at displaying or, or being? And, and how could you get better? How could you practice um, developing these things? Well, um, we obviously most of our students have not been in school since um, the 16th of March. Um, our Form 4s and Lower 6 have come back this week, um, but other students remain, you know, working from home uh, by remote learning. I wonder if you could say a little bit about, you know, what KTJ teachers have learned from this experience and how you, you think that might be then um, brought, you know, into the classroom when we're all back in school, hopefully in September. Yeah. Um, so um, for for our teachers having to go home and within a, there was a turnaround of less than 24 hours when we said, right, you now need to teach online. So um, they they have had to um, develop a lot of skills using technology. Um, and um, they have many, many teachers have got very excited in conversations I've had with them on Zoom about I didn't know this existed. Now I've tried this and now I've tried that. And they're really keen to combine all these ideas that they've learned with technology, with what they can do in the classroom. So combining the best of both worlds. Um, so that's something we're all quite excited about for next year. Um, I was gonna say something else, it's just gone. Um, Oh yes, I think another thing that the that we've been talking about an awful lot is um, helping our students with their time management. So students have um, the, some students who have um, possibly been quite quiet in classes have actually really flourished online and have managed to stay on top of all their assignments. And we're really impressed with the progress that they're making. And there are other students who in the past we haven't been so concerned about in school, but they found the, the, the need to um, manage themselves and, and, and meet deadlines really challenging because they haven't got a teacher who's in the same room as them reminding them or saying, as we have to sometimes do, right, you haven't done your work and I'm going to set your detention so to give you some time to do your work. Um, so I think um, it's really highlighted how much structure and help some of our students do need with their time management. So that's something that we're going to be making sure um, that we spend even, we've, it's not something that we, we've not looked at before, but I think we will be looking at that even more in the future. Okay, thank you. Now we've only got a couple of minutes left. So one final question. Um, we've talked a lot about IGCSE exams and, and syllabuses, but obviously, you know, our aim is to provide an holistic education at KTJ. I wondered if you could just briefly sort of talk about the importance of those other aspects that we offer as part of our, you know, curriculum and extracurriculum. Yes. So um, it, the, the, the students will um, ultimately be focusing on some examinations towards the end of their course. Um, but throughout their time at KTJ, there's so many different things that we offer and we don't offer other things just for fun. We offer them, well, they are fun, some of them, which is great, um, but they develop um, a huge range of skills. So all the extracurricular activities um, that are put on every day after school, all the talks that we offer, um, the um, universities that come in that explain um, what's on offer, um, that there's so many different things that students can get involved with. Um, they can also choose not to get involved because we wouldn't be forcing them to get involved with lots of different activities. Um, but we always encourage them to. And as parents, um, you'll be doing uh, your children a great service if you say, well, what is it? What are you working on? And what are you having fun with? Um, and um, um, what, what ECA are you setting up for the school that you're badgering the school to help you um, begin? So there are many, many different things aside from just working towards examinations that's part of the, the KTJ learning experience. Okay, thank you very much. Um, okay, I've just got a question here, um, which I can answer as well, about um, if my child is interested in joining KTJ for IGCSEs, when would be the latest you recommend to drop by for an entrance exam? Well, um, we do fill up, particularly for day places, very quickly. So um, I would recommend, obviously, you do it as soon as you can um, in advance of that year. Um, I've shared with you the um, email address for the registrar and all of that information is also available on our website. And um, 
I can see that the, the person asking us their, their child is current in year seven. Obviously, we would like uh, students to join us as soon as they can. And, um, you know, obviously that helps us to prepare them. But um, IG, IGCSE is a form four and a form five course. And we will um, take students on as long as we still have places. But there is no harm in getting in touch with the registrar even you know, two or three years before the time at which you want to enter the school. It means we have you on our books and um, you know we'll make sure we keep you up to date with what's going on at KTJ. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. So, uh, Anna, thank you very much for such an informative presentation and your answers to the questions as well. That brings us to the end of our, our virtual open day this morning. Thank you for joining us. This webinar has been recorded and will soon be available on the KTJ YouTube channel, along with other virtual open days, which we've been offering um, in recent weeks, including one which we did earlier today on boarding and ones which we did uh, last week on forms one to three and the week before on A-levels. So if you would like to find out more about joining KTJ, please do get in touch with our admissions team. You can do that by emailing registrar at ktj.edu.my or just go to our website where you'll find all of our contact details. In the meantime, stay safe, enjoy your weekend, uh, and goodbye from us.